thanks for coming. My name is Steve Wallace, and I am a network architect at IU, but I also uh, fly drones on the side, and I do a little flying of drones for IU. So briefly, uh, the schedule for the workshop is 1 to 5. Today, the goal of the workshop is to better equip people with an understanding of what it takes to fly a drone at IU, and what I mean by that, what are the, what are the requirements, what are IU's requirements. In addition to that, um, there are going to be a couple of folks giving presentations to share what they do flying drones for IU and what that's like. We have some people from our research technology group, and they're going to demonstrate some of the tools that they have to take data you might collect from a drone and turn it into you know, uh, more useful information. And uh, the weather looks good. Uh, we should do a couple of drone flights. Uh, we're going to do those flights in this field that's just uh, north of the parking lot over here. And I think we'll have two different drone flights. So when we're all wrapped up here, we'll head out there and a couple different crews will get, get their drones set up. Um, during the presentations, let me... So I've introduced myself. Larry Stevens is here um, from uh, Lawson Claims Control. They're sort of the regulatory body of IU for things like drones. Seth Wagner, is Seth here? Great, okay. Seth's going to talk about uh, occupational safety issues. Um, Eric, um, who's both a, a real pilot and a, and a Part 107 pilot, is going to talk about what uh, his group uses, does with drones. Tassie is from our research technology group. She's going to talk about uh, some of the things that they can do with the data. Uh, Quinn? Are you here? Ah, great. Uh, Quinn's going to show us some fancy drone stuff. Uh, and Jeremy um, is going to do, uh, is Jeremy here? I think he may be showing up later. Oh, there, great. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Um, Jeremy's uh, also going to do one of the, the demo flights out back. So this is the rough agenda. It's wrong. Um, <laughs> At 4.15, it, it would seem to suggest that Jeremy's going to do a presentation, but he's going to do a flight. Um, I don't, it's not clear to me how, uh, how accurate the schedule is. Um, uh, we'll just use it as a general guide. What I would like to do, so this is being uh, streamed and recorded, and it's probably better when a presenter is describing things, if you can wait till the end to ask questions. When you ask questions, we'll have somebody get a mic to you, uh, and that mic is to ensure that people who are watching this remotely or, or want to watch the stream later on um, can hear the question. Uh, we'll have a break. There's also snacks you can access at any time over on that side of the room. Uh, if you have any other questions or concerns about what's going on here, let me know. There are just a couple of, I guess, logistic points. There are restrooms. So we go around here and take a left. They're, they're over there. Uh, there's also a place that sells food and drink behind me. Uh, and again, thanks for coming. So the first up is is Larry. And Larry, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna I'm gonna get your slides going. And you can use this or the Okay, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um I'm a frustrated drone pilot, frustrated because I have no money to buy one. So uh, I, I watch when Eric flies and I envy him. Um, you'll see here that uh, we have a web page that's dedicated to drones. IU was pretty much in the forefront among the universities of recognizing that drones could both be beneficial and be a problem. And so we developed the policy and some procedures to control the use of them. The web page is there at NLOC. And we'll see if it loads up here. And you simply go to Applications. And down here to uh, Drones. Now I'm working on this. This is going to change just a little bit. I'm going to take some uh, things out of this. but. While I'm looking at this, let me point out very quickly the daily flight log. As Eric knows, 
Eric, where are you? There he is. Eric does a lot of flying. He knows if you're flying for IU, and that includes commercial operators that are flying for IU, before every flight anywhere in the world, log on here to the daily flight log and, and list your flight. And we do have drones all over the world. We have uh, somebody that's operating in Greece on a regular basis, and I think there's somebody in Mexico. So we want you to log on and tell us where you're flying in case a question comes up. Let's go to the policy. Looks like every other IU policy, I suppose. And there's been some changes that we're making in this. It'll be up, the changes will be up in just a few days. One of the changes we had to make was we kept talking about we were going to regulate drones that fly over IU property. And the FAA says we can't do that. So we're changing that language in here. We can regulate if you take off from IU property. We can certainly grab your drone if you crash on IU property. But we can't stop you from flying over IU property if you launch off, off our campus. That's worrisome, both because of the danger to people. And I've seen several drones flying that are obviously not flying within regulations, flying directly over people and flying too high and whatever. It's also a concern because of privacy. You can have somebody flying a drone and hovering outside of a dorm and taking pictures inside the windows. But right now, there's nothing we can do about it legally. So uh, I'm not sure if IUPD has a drone killer or not, but they've been talking about finding one. Um, point out here that if you're flying for IU, let's see if I can switch pages here. That says, no, that's the wrong direction. If you're flying for IU, you are not a hobbyist. If you're flying for IU, you are not a hobbyist. Early on, we had some people trying to get around the regulations of having a license by saying, well, I'll just fly as a hobbyist. By definition, if you are flying for IU, you cannot be flying as a hobbyist. You have to have your Part 107 license. Now, we do have some people flying their own drones. Steve's one of them. But we do not allow you to fly your own drone on IU business unless you have your Part 107 license. So you cannot fly on behalf of IU without that license. Now, early on, we were looking at uh, other types of uh, licensing, Part uh, the 333 exemption, COAs. That's all gone by the wayside now. Very rarely would we need a COA, although I did get one just the other day, but that's very specialized flying. Almost everyone will be flying under Part 107, and they're going to talk about that in a few minutes. You must, if you're flying your own drone, you must provide proof of insurance. And Steve does that every time he flies. Now, if you're flying for IU, of course, we insure you. The policy and procedures apply worldwide. The fellows flying in Greece, same policy, same procedures. Now, I will note here, so I don't forget it later, if you're flying inside, and we do allow a few people to fly inside buildings, they're very specialized operations. They're testing drones for, one of them is testing a drone for looking at equipment. It can fly around the room and check dials and things like that. You don't have to have an FAA per, um, permit for your drone if you're flying inside. But you have to abide by all the rules. And you don't have to have a Part 107 license. But you have to ab uh, abide by all of our other regulations. For third parties like hobbyists, we do have one place where we will allow you to fly. Again, we can't really regulate that the way I'd like to, but... We have one place where we'd like for them to fly, and that's out by Tulip Tree. There's a big empty field out there. That's the first place we saw Eric flying out there. Now, when you receive your new drone, contact me immediately. Our department is the only one that registers IU drones. 
costs five dollars. It can be done in ten minutes if I'm in. And usually I'm in or I'll check in from home or whatever. It's very quick, very easy. And I just had to ask some information about your drone, what you would expect I would need, the model, the make, and the serial number, basically. And we'll get your FAA number for you. Katina Anglin, uh, Katina's sitting right back here. You'll talk to her about getting the insurance. The insurance is about $1,000 a year. If you're flying a drone as a hobbyist, I strongly urge you to make sure you have insurance coverage. Your homeowner's policy probably does not cover you. So if you hit somebody, if you damage some property and you don't have insurance, then it comes out of your pocket. Now there is an organization and I, there's a link on the hobbyist page. We're not gonna look at it, but it's there. There's an organization you can join. The, the fees are very low and, and they have a half million dollars worth of coverage that comes with it. So that's a good organization to join, but don't rely on your homeowners to cover you if you have an accident. And be sure to read that policy that you see there about video surveillance. How do I get back to my web page, Steve? I was asleep when you gave me those instructions. Yeah. Let me see this. There you go. Okay. Thank you. We're going to be on this page for a bit? For a little bit. So you can see I've covered about everything that's on here. There are some prohibited uses. Basically, don't fly around the buildings and take pictures inside. Don't fly over people. We had rumors that uh, one of the athletic teams had a drone to fly over the football practices. Well, as long as they're staying away and looking out, that's okay, but they can't fly over the team and look down. So just keep in mind all the safety regulations and rules as you're flying. There's some contacts there. So we go back here. I need technical assistance here. There? Yeah, I can get that right there. Here? Double click, I think. Yep. Okay. Okay, the procedures pages are linked off that same page on our home page there. And let's see if I can find the right one here. Your drone must be operated with a part 107 remote pilot in command present. Do not try to fly or do not fly without a 107 licensed pilot there. Procedures, you can read over those. I mean, they're not, they're not complicated. They're simple to understand. We require you to read those before you are approved. There's a committee that approves people. If you want to fly a drone for IU, you make an application. And of course, we got to log in. Steve, could you hand me my phone from back there? Yes, yeah, right back there. Putting you to work here. Thank you. And I'm going to show you a completed application. There's Steve's. I think this is the one I want to show you. Yeah. So you, you go through the application, and again, it's simple to understand. We do expect you to read the policy. We do expect you to read the procedures. 
We do expect you to read the safety manual, and Seth's going to talk about that in a little bit. Fill in the information. Provide a picture. And down here, fill in this information. The committee wants to know what you're going to do with that drone. They want to know where you're flying, why you're flying, what kind of pictures you're going to be taking, what kind of safety precautions you're going to be taking. And they look very carefully at this. The uh, chief privacy officer, and you're seeing some stuff here you won't normally see. I'm on here because of, I'm an admin, so you see these down here. But the chief privacy officer, Sarah Chambers, looks at these very carefully. She's very concerned about what you're going to do with that camera on that drone. So fill these out. We have people that do this and leave all that blank. I just have to go back and say, go back to your application and fill out the information. So just do it ahead of time. Normally, we can get these approved in four or five days. Once we approve it, you can see there's us, Environmental Health and Safety, IUPD, Emergency Management, Legal Counsel, Chief Security Officer, and Chief Privacy Officer. We all have to look at it and approve it. If we don't all approve it, you don't get to go. So we approve it. I'll get back with you. You arrange the insurance, and you're good to go. I think she's talking about right here. I think I added that after Dr. Johnson filled this out. But if you'll fill out that information, and that's really what I need uh, for the FAA also, but we need this for the insurance. I don't know if this is working. Yeah. If you can go back in and put in the serial number, I have to have that in order to get it really insured. And so typically people are emailing them to me, but I'm noticing now that when I get the policy from the insurance company, the only thing they're referencing is the serial number. So it's hard for me to match up and to make sure that I'm keeping accurate track of it if I can't go back to this and look at that, look for that information. So if you can at some point go in there and enter the serial number, model number, and account number, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So for clarification, when you're in the form, put in the serial number, whatever, in this section right here, then click Update UAS-1. This is actually a separate part of the form from the rest of it because we've had at least one department with two drones. So rather than fill out two applications, we made it so they can add up to five drones here on one application. Other questions about this while I'm here? The look of this is changing, but the information is going to stay the same. Okay, my part's pretty simple here. Just follow the policy, uh, fill out the form, follow the procedures when you fly, fill out the flight log before you fly. So if we get a question, and IUPD has access to this, if they get a question about this strange looking person out flying a drone, they can find out about the drone, not the strange looking person, but they can find out about the drone and they'll know if you're legal or not. Questions? Okay, one, one big concern we have is safety. We certainly do not want you hurting somebody. We don't want you flying into our buildings and damaging our buildings. And so we ask environmental health and safety to help us and they wrote safety regulations. And this is where I turn it over to Seth and let him take over. Okay, cool. 
All right, good afternoon. I'm Seth Wagner, I'm the manager of occupational safety at IU Bloomington Environmental Health and Safety. Uh, personally, I don't have a lot of, of experience with drones. Um, some of the stuff might seem a little dry. I know that the stuff you guys are going to be doing later is a lot more fun than this, but I have about uh, close to 20 bullet points that I'm going to go through, and the entirety of our safety program can be found at that link. I don't know, Steve, if you're going to make these presentations available to the, the course or not, but you can go to protectiu.edu and search for um, unmanned aircraft system, and you can find it that way. So being occupational safety, our drone program is um, mainly focused on when you are flying as a university employee or student or part of a university activity. So its purpose is to protect employees, students, and the public against the potential hazards that come with operating drones. And we do so by establishing the minimum performance requirements um, in accordance with the FAA and Academy of Model Aeronautics. As I said, it covers employees, students, and other entities operating drones on uh, any IU-owned property or land. Um, the program, you know, while it lays out guidelines, it doesn't supersede um, a higher governing body such as the FAA. So particular responsibilities of the operator, which I believe is why all you guys are here, uh, you are to comply with all applicable aspects of this program and all applicable federal, state, and local laws and regulations regarding safe use and operation of drones. Uh, attend and complete training required by the overseeing department and then present any registration or documentation that you might have regarding your drone and your insurance to Larry's group. Here's where we get into the fun stuff. Um, I'm really just going to breeze through these. Um, they can be found in their entirety on the program, but these were some of the, um, the important ones that I pulled out. If anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt as we work our way through. So your drones must weigh less than 55 pounds, and whenever you're flying, you need to have a continuous uh, visual line of sight, and you can't maintain that eye of sight or that uh, visual line of sight with binoculars or a telescope or anything other than you know maybe corrective lenses or contacts. Uh, spotters and visual observers may be used to aid the operator, but they can't be used in place of the uh, ABOR, aforementioned requirement. So you can't use a spotter, um, or you need to use a spotter, and you know you can't use binoculars. At least one spotter or observer must be used if you're um, flying in an area where pedestrians or bystanders could wander into the safe fly zone. You need a weather visibility of three miles um, from wherever you're flying. No person may act as an operator for more than one unmanned aircraft operation at one time. No operations are permitted from a moving vehicle or aircraft, except if you're on the water. You shall not fly a drone within 25 feet of any vehicle or unprotected person. For employees and students flying as uh, part of a university activity, which I assume most of you will be doing, drones uh, can't be fl uh, flown within 100 feet of any building or overhead utility lines. Now, there are um, exceptions to that, but that requires review from um, the h Larry's department, and any other stakeholder. You aren't to fly over private property unless you get written consent from the owner. And I know just how you know we have private neighborhoods that borderline border campus that could come up. So if you think you're going to be flying over someone's house, it's, it's best to you know knock on their door and get permission from them before. Drones may only be flown during daylight hours. Uh, drones must yield the right of way to other aircraft, manned or unmanned. Do not exceed a maximum airspeed of 100 miles an hour, and don't fly higher than 400 feet. So at a minimum, before you guys take, uh, take flight, 
you need to go through a uh, pre-flight inspection. And at the very least, that's a, you know, a visual inspection of your drone to make sure everything looks okay and a function test of all the controls before you take off. Um, some of this stuff is pretty common sense. Don't, don't be flying your drone if you're inebriated or in an unsafe mental condition. Drones must be operated in a manner that does not interfere with any other aircraft. And if you or your observer see that your drone is malfunctioning or uh, kind of acting weird, land it as soon as possible and don't take back off until you get the problem corrected. Um, in the event that you fly within five miles of an airport, you must communicate with that airport and air traffic control tower prior to doing so. No metal blade propellers or boosters shall be used unless special approval is received by IU EHNS. And drones shall not carry any hazardous uh, chemicals, pyrotechnic devices, uh, anything flammable, or something intentionally designed to separate from the aircraft. These are uh, links for more information. There's my number down there. I can assure you that, you know, there are people in our office that are a little more versed on drones than myself, but that's where you find the information, and um, please feel free to contact us if you need anything. Thank you. Whoa. You're caught. Thanks. Eric. <laughs> so we're going pretty fast if we keep this up. It means more drone flying. Yeah, do we have any questions at this point so far? OK. Uh, this must be yours, right? Uh, yep. If I hit just uh, enter, it'll go, right, we think? Uh, we so you can able. go ahead with this. OK. If you want to walk around, yep. you can do this. All right. Um, Perfect. You're one. We'll see how the media play. I think the media will play. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. He said it. They checked it. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. A little nervous, so bear with me. Um, I have a couple of questions. Of, um, I wanted to take an informal poll. Who has a license? We haven't asked. Who's wanting to get one? Okay. Um, a little overview. Uh, IU Commun I'm Eric Rudd with IE Communications. Um, one of the first drone pilots on campus. Uh, I, prior to this uh, presentation, I got on my email and I started searching when I started first talking to Larry Stevens about getting a drone on campus. And we found emails. I found emails about February 2015. So we've been doing battle with this for about three years now. Um, I would also noticed that my license, Part 107 license, is uh, due for renewal next month. So I need to start brushing up on the regulations that have changed, which is uh, things have been fast and furious since uh, 2015. So a um, lot to keep up with, uh, lots of uh, changes in the regulations and things like that. Um, when we first started, it was, uh, you know, certificates of authorizations and part 333s and all this crazy stuff. And those of you who are working to get your license now, the part 107 um, angle of things makes stuff way easier. So I'm, I'm happy for you that you have to just study for a simple test. And uh, it seems to be fairly self-explanatory about uh, how to get a uh, drone license. Um, so I want to just talk to you briefly. Um, I realize our number one goal in, at IE Communications was to uh, get a camera in the air, whether that's video or, and or still photography. So for me, it was a flying platform to get those kinds of images. I'm going to talk a, a very top level, uh, just scratch the surface about some of the rudimentary planning that goes into um, the shoots that we do. Um, I'm actually looking forward to some of the presentations that follow because I know that there are a lot of people here using drones that are smarter than I and that use a lot of different technology. Um, so I'm curious to see what's going on there. So when we first started this drone, uh, drone search, um, I didn't have gray hair. So. All right, um, first section is uh, planning. 
a shoot. This is a shot we did from graduation uh, back in May. Uh, there's two sides to this, kind of an internal um, creative team kind of uh, planning, and then we have to make sure that we're legal with FAFA and uh, inlox requirements. So in terms of the planning process, the first thing that we do is what are our needs, whether it's um, they fall into two categories, whether they're client driven or internal driven. We may have a particular project where we think a particular shot might be attractive. Um, I guess we'll, you know, in terms of, we'll stick with video for a second. So is the, tr is the uh, drone the right tool for the job? That's one of the things that we talk about. Um, sometimes we get requests at IUCOM for specific client-driven stuff. Um, a year or two ago, um, facilities asked us to take some pictures um, above Franklin Hall. Uh, there were some windows that they were going to repair that they could not get to with ladders. Um, so we flew up there and took stills of the roof and the, and the upper level windows so that they could get a handle on um, the kind of work that needed to be done. So those are two distinct different uh, uh, planning needs. Obviously, we will uh, look at weather for uh, you know, the Part 107 requirements, but certainly whether it will visually impact uh, what we're going for. Um, we take into consideration time of day of the shoot. Uh, when I first started as a photographer, I was a big golden hour shooter. Um, you know, dragging myself up early in the morning, going to bed really late. And then I decided as a still photographer, I would rather be home having dinner with my family than trying to find some wacky, beautiful light. So I would shoot at all times of the day. However, with drones uh, and video and drone stills, I kind of got to thinking as Google Maps got better about the satellite imagery, I always was more attracted to the images when the angle of the light was really low because you get a, um, a highlight and a, a shadow contrast from, from left to right in the image. So generally, if we had that luxury of planning, I tend to try and work it out so that we're flying earlier in the day so we can get a fl or later in the day, so we can get a flatter angle. It just looks a little more uh, attractive. We don't necessarily have that luxury. Um, one of the visual vis visualization tools I've used on my phone is Sunseeker. It's a great little app. Um, it's about 14 bucks or so. Um, it will show you. Um, you can put in locations by city. You can store locations. You can search locations. And it will tell you and show you the angle of the sun um, based on the calendar date. You can put it into the future if you want. Um, you, when you're holding it and you pivot, it will show you where the sun is going to be in relation to where you're standing. Sometimes you lose a sense of where things will be, certainly in the winter months when there's lower angles. So that's a great little tool if you need an idea about when and where the sun's going to be where it is. Site assessment, um, you know, it's common sense stuff. Uh, how many bodies are going to be there? Who, uh, where are they going to be? Where are they coming from? Those kinds of things. Larry uh, touched on the subject about flying over people. Um, one of the aspects of the work that we do is I sometimes think we run a slightly thinner edge of working the drone around people than, say, someone who's doing geo mapping, mainly because we're trying to get we're trying to get people in our images. So we have to be careful about where they are and what they're doing. Um, one of the nice tricks that we've kind of discovered is you can give the impression of being over a group and not really be over a group because of the angle of where the drone is in relation to the camera angle. Um, you can certainly give the feel of being right above when you're probably a good 20 to 30, 40, 50 yards um, away from being directly vertical. Larry touched on the privacy thing. Um, we try to be mindful of not flying too close to buildings. Certainly dorms are a, um, a consideration. We do, uh, as I'll touch on through a little bit of this talk, we do stress the importance of communicating with anybody and everybody who may have a vested or non-vested interest in your flight. Um, 
oftentimes we do creatively, we will uh, do scouting images, try and figure out some angles that look attractive, um, some motions that might look attractive based on uh, the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, Tyler's a big uh, proponent of, uh, we'll go into Google Street View and look at, uh, kind of pre-fly the route to some extent to get a sense of what we will actually want to capture. One of the other things that we uh, work on is uh, briefing our visual observers. I did a flight a few weeks ago um, where we launched off a parking garage in downtown Indy to get some monument circle stuff for kind of like a, you know, IUPUI, bit of a chamber of commerce, this is where the students go kind of footage. And you, we have two-way radios that we picked up from B&H that are useful where we all can be on the same channel and you kind of, um, you can send a visual observer on ahead, and basically what I use them for is um, one of the things you have to be mindful of is um, as the drone is out away from you, your depth of field, the ability to discern depth of field and distance is uh, diminished. So what I like to do is have somebody viewing on a 90 degree angle of where I'm flying so that they can raise an arm or scream at me if I'm getting too close to something where I can't judge how far away I am. So those kinds of things. Um, talk to the visual observers about, uh, you know, after you've walked the route, um, buildings or structures or things that you're concerned about hitting and trying to find ways to communicate not to do that. Camera operator briefing, we have a drone, um, it's the Inspire 1 um, that we can run single or dual controller. Hopefully, if the weather cooperates, we're going to uh, launch and run dual controller to, to give you an example of what's that like. Um, controller 1 runs the camera, basically it's like the, uh, you know, the if you've seen in the movies the dolly where they're pushing the camera along, the, the guy that's pushing the camera physically is the, the drone flyer and then the other gentleman or lady would be the camera operator. Generally, uh, Tyler and I work as a team. Um, he gives me an idea of what kind of camera shot that he wants, the kind of motion that he wants. And I love that relationship because I can concentrate. I'm always a big fan of flying, uh, flying the drone and not looking at the screen. So I can actually be more creative with the motion that I have because I can actually focus on the drone and he can react to the path that I'm giving him because he has 360 degree control over the camera. Um, he can tell me to speed up, slow down, change altitude, and I can react to his uh, direction and I think that works out really well. Usually I will go single controller when I'm taking still photography just because it's quick and easy. Uh, just people will be touching on this uh, a lot. File the flight log within lock. BFR map research, whether you need additional authorizations and communicate with everyone. There are a number of VFR maps online. Um, they're free to access. We will do some scouting of where we need to fly. The tricky part is um, street detail and actual on the ground detail of these maps uh, is very limited. So what we tend to do is we uh, compare this, I put it on the bottom here, I would definitely recommend firing up Google Maps and trying to overlay the two in terms of where you fly or don't fly. Um, we have generally looked at every, yeah, we've looked at every campus uh, for IU. The only one where it's a flat out no, and f correct me if I'm wrong, which was the other one? What? Kokomo and Columbus. I know for, I'm, I'm not sure about Kokomo's, but Columbus is, uh, if you've ever been up there, there's the, the campus building is literally at the end of the runway. So uh, you, when the tower is operating, you can't fly on uh, campus at Columbus. However, we've gotten around that. Um, from the 107 is at this time, I think in the, this time of year, the tower opens, opens at 7 a.m. So it's Class G airspace before that, so we've done some sunrise shots on Columbus campus. So, so uh, one comment I'll make about the maps is I actually use uh, uh, an application on my iPad 
which normally pilots use in real planes, and it's called ForeFlight. And there are different levels of subscription to ForeFlight, and the least expensive subscription, which is about $100 a year, gives you a really spectacular view of the airspace. And you can, one of the things you can do is you can say, oh, okay, I just want to see uh, the airspace classifications over a Google map. Mm -hmm. And it, it also uh, is one of the most reliable things for, for uh, temporary flight restrictions, um, you know, the airport weather, all that stuff. So anyway. Yep. Okay. And we'll take some questions at the end of this real quick. Uh, yeah, I wanted to touch on a couple things. To highlight some things that have changed, uh, my benchmark here flying on the IEB campus is uh, everything west of Indiana Avenue is Class D airspace. That's just almost exactly where the five statute mile radius from Monroe County ends. So um, I'm free to fly generally east of Indiana Avenue. Now, when I started flying here, the Class E surface extension which is a, a controlled airspace, uh, you had to have a specific authorization from the FAA to fly, um, which I re received. You had to write and fill out a form, ask for permission. Um, Steve has pointed out a few months ago their, their own interpretation of their own law has changed, and now um, only airports that are actually Class E is where you would need to get the authorization. The extens extensions are no longer relevant for flying for, with an authorization, i.e., that means all you need is a 107 and follow the in-lock rules to fly at IU Bloomington. And as you learn about your airspace, that will become more relevant or more understandable. Uh, Indianapolis. Um, it's a different kind of airspace. It's an upside down wedding cake, so all of the IUPUI campus is underneath controlled airspace. It doesn't begin until something like 2,700 or 4,000 feet, I don't remember off the top of my head. So you can fly anywhere that you want-ish. Bear in mind there are a number of hospitals with very active helipads. I've had to dodge incoming helicopters quite often flying around IUPUI, so you do need to be aware of what's going on. That's where the visual observers are very helpful. Uh, Columbus is controlled airspace, so you can't fly with the tower open. Some camera stuff, some kind of creative things, a little touching on a bunch of stuff. Um, if you're operating a drone with a camera, the number one thing that trips me up is when I am doing a move where I'm looking at the viewfinder and I'm pulling away from a subject. In other words, the, cam the drone is flying in a direction opposite of the camera. 97% of the time I forget that I need to pay attention to what I may back up into. It's easier when you're flying towards something to avoid it. So don't get caught admiring your own work and crash into something when you're when you're pulling away from or, or panning around something. Remember where you're headed. Um, retaining line of sight is important. Um, obviously, you don't want to lose sight of the drone. Uh, helicopters and, uh, and airports are a consideration. Some creative, real easy stuff we'll touch base on. Um, and I'm going to start at the bottom first. Keep it simple with your camera moves if you're trying to get something artistic. I try to use the drone as an extension of a um, camera move that already exists. So like simple jib shots, um, uh, dolly shots, things like that. Um, when you start trying to manu maneuver the camera in multiple axes, is when things start looking herky-jerky, and I try to mimic what I see in movies, where if, if the camera is moving, I generally don't pan too much. I certainly don't pilt, uh, pan and tilt at the same time. Two axes of motion is usually enough when you're shooting video on any camera, I would say, on a, a drone as well. So keep it simple. Don't be too, there's a lot going on flying the thing and trying to do all the creative uh, camera moves. Um, some of the tools that we use that are helpful is, uh, you know, 
we call here point A to B autonomous flight. So using pre-programmed waypoints or um, that's where you can establish two locations in space and you can tell the drone fly to point A to point B and that flight then becomes a little bit less um, work and concentration on your part. The other thing is that it tends to do it a little more smoothly than you will if you're busy doing other things. So it knows what it's doing. Um, there's core lock, which is useful to kind of recreate um, some dolly moves. And it, on our drone, you can say, I want the drone to, f tr the course to be this way. And it, when you push forward and back, it will only go along this route, regardless of which way the nose is pointing. So that's useful for um, just maintaining a steady um, course of action. It's tricky. Uh, as I said when I started this thing, to, f to follow people, to follow movement, to keep your distance from people as they're tracking. So it takes a lot of practice. One of the things that I have, one of the, the tips that I've learned is um, sometimes I'll go out to a parking lot and I won't mess with the, the, the camera, but I'll park the drone maybe 15 feet away from me at eye level and I practice with the nose pointing in different directions. So I will walk towards it and I, and I fly it so that that position in space relative to me doesn't change or tries to not make a change. And then I will, you know, make X's and then I will, you know, make, basically make it track me and then I'll do it in different orientations. So that's a good way to practice um, maneuvering the drone. The other thing that um, you fall victim of is the GPS mode on there where you basically let go of the sticks and on ours it will just stay there. You know, it'll break to stop. Um, the other challenge is what I call the ice skate rink mode where you basically shut the GPS off and then once you get the thing going, it, you need to counter control it to stop it. That's great practice as well. You're just simply flying the thing with no satellite control. That's really, you know, that stick and rudder kind of flying that you need to practice as well. Uh, video heads and tails. So make sure that you shoot through the beginning and the ends of the clips that you need. Remember, you may only use probably two, maybe four seconds of video of any one shot, but make sure you sh let it roll through the end. Don't be in a big rush to shut the recorder off and turn it back on. Um, keep your move, you know, again, keep it simple. Uh, don't go from one move to another. If you're doing a linear shot, then don't start trying to do something else. It just gets a little too complicated visually. Um, uh, one of the things that we've kind of learned creatively is you don't need to be way up there to get great looking footage. There's a, there's a height of diminishing returns. As soon as you get above roof line level, you realize that everybody hides their HVAC on tops of buildings and things like that, and it gets unattractive real quick. Sometimes simply just having the elevation change of being on a step ladder is enough to make what you're shooting visually interesting. Once you get through that no man's land of altitude, then you start looking for um, graphic elements and patterns and, and visually interesting things in what you're looking straight down at. Um, but it takes a little bit of hunting for that kind of stuff. Uh, last thing on this slide, you most likely will need a uh, neutral density filter or an ND filter on your camera if you're shooting video. Um, most video you'll be shooting at uh, the shutter speed will be 1 50th of a second, which is too slow, too wide open, so to speak, um, if you want to stop down and get uh, a little more shallow depth of field. So you'll put, want to put a, probably a five to six stop ND filter on your camera. Um, with your crew, dis and this is, uh, yeah, discuss with the people around you and yourself how you're going to handle bystander inquiries. Over the th three years I've been flying here, I've had all sorts of experiences with people, well-meaning, um, asking what I'm doing. The IUPD has been great. They usually come up and ask. They're curious. No problems there. Um, I have had faculty run out of buildings yelling at me. I have had um, event security demanding that I stop flying right away. 
while I'm trying to control the, con the aircraft. You are well within your right to totally ignore them until you are in a position where it's safe to have a conversation with them. Sometimes I simply politely say, I'm in the middle of something, I'll talk to you in a minute. I land and then we have the conversation, I get out all the paperwork and those kinds of things. So talk to the people that you're working with how you're going to handle that kind of communication because it will happen. On the other hand, I have had people in my scenes or in where I'm shooting who are totally oblivious to the drone being in the area. Like they, it's like they're so used to it or whatever. I was doing a shoot over by the sample gates. I had a group of people that they were interacting. I was 15 feet, well, probably lower. For this example, definitely lower. I was about head height and I was going to pull back away from this group. Along comes a student, not looking on their iPhone, eyes up, looking around, walking right at my drone, which was head height, and if had I not noticed and gunned it to get out of his way, he would have walked face first into, you know, a 15-pound drone with four blades going on. I don't know what he was thinking about, so you will get both ends of the spectrum in terms of the people that are around you. Um, communicate with everybody in lock form, um, depending on the nature of what we're shooting, like the graduation at the beginning of this, we send emails to everybody, even if they're connected to that form. We talk to events, we talk to security, we talk to the IUPD, we talk to the chief of police. Um, let everybody know that you possibly can so that uh, they can communicate to their people. IDs. I wear my uh, some IU red shirt when I fly, mostly just so that you look more authentic and your people think you know where you, you know you are where you're supposed to be. Uh, limestone buildings and Wi-Fi. Um, I have no scientific data on this, but I think the IU Secure messes with um, the communication sometimes between my remote and the drone. It's the same frequency or very close to Wi-Fi that we all use and limestone buildings are great at masking the communication between the two so be mindful of that uh, don't forget your return return to home altitude needs to be higher than anything else around you so if you lose communication with the drone and it wants to come home to see you that you remind it that there are a hundred foot trees everywhere and coming back home to you at 50 feet is probably a bad idea um, the seven I've talked to, uh, discuss how your workflow is going to be. You've, you've launched, you're so excited, you've been flying for three hours, you've put all your, f your footage on a micro disc, and then it goes into the White River. That's bad. So per periodically remind yourself to take the card out, back it up, and get the, the assets that have been flying around at 300 feet off the drone so that you can use it in the future. A couple little small things. There are varying ways to log your flights. Kitty Hawk, paper logs. There's a ton of software that you guys probably know more than I do. I just wanted to get up and fly. But there are some great um, geomapping things and companies have definitely gotten on board about uh, what kind of tools you can use. And I wanted to leave you with a little demo reel we did probably a year, a couple of years ago. It's very, very brief. And we've got other footage since then, but I thought you might like this. I think if we do that, it should go. <laughs> I got any anybody have any questions? Real quick, you said you want to renew your license. How often do you have to? 
So the question was, uh, he asked about my renewing my license and how often I have to do that. It's every two years. Um, same for regular pilots. It's called a biennial flight review if you're a pilot, but basically I have to take the written exam. Um, I think, I've got to get up to speed, but I think a couple sections are omitted. I don't think I have to cover any weather related stuff. What else was there, Tyler? Okay, drone, re, your drone needs to be read, re registered, so I'm going to work with Larry about that. But every two years, basically, I have to take the written again, but there's certain sections that, that uh, I don't have to do. Okay. The question is, do I do it myself? When do I decide between flying uh, either with a second con uh, second f controller and or pre-programming things? Depends on the shot. Um, I have to assess whether pre-programming it gains me any controllability, if that's a word, advantage. For example, we were trying to do something where I wanted to track down um, Meridian Street towards the uh, Monument Circle. And because of the height, the altitude that I wanted to try to do this, I tr tried to do waypoints down the street so that I wouldn't have to worry about um, controlling the drone down the, down the middle of the road. It, the, the wind was a different factor in that particular shot. Um, it's really what... It's what your comfort level is. Um, I have an understanding with the people that I work with as if I'm the pilot, I have the final say on whether I'm, a, I'm getting into wiggly territory and I don't feel comfortable doing what I'm doing. Then we can decide whether pre-programming it helps me alleviate that stress. The other thing, you know, pre-programming is also like using flashes on stands when you're a still photographer. Um, it limits your flexibility to get something other than what you've just programmed. So the happy accidents aren't as ha you know pr as prevalent. Sometimes you uh, you don't have the opportunity to react what you've just tried to do, but adjust it. So that's the other thing to think about. I had another point about that. Anyway, so it's it's a it's a moving target. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I went through an online, was it UAV drone, drone school, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asked, uh, I mentioned that the IU Secure may or may not be affecting. Um, all I know is that I get a reading on my DJI app that says strong signal interference most of the time when I'm on campus, and if I'm flying at Bradford Woods, I don't get that. Um, the other tr problematic area, even though it's the number one icon on campus, sample gates for some reason. Um, I think it's because of the proximity of the buildings. I also think there might be something metallic under the sidewalk right there. I don't know what it is, but I cannot calibrate my, cam my compass at that spot. So I don't, again, it's not a scientific study, but those kinds of things you you might run up against in terms of uh, the technology. Sometimes simply um, like another example, I was at IUPUI just a few weeks ago and I, we were on top of one of the parking garages, which I thought would be a totally fine place. You know, you do the, ca the calibration dance where you tell it to calibrate and you spin it around and it, it uh, registers the compass and the GPS and all that kind of stuff. We were on the top of the parking garage and the interference was so strong that it would not do anything. But getting off of the garage, going 25 yards across the street into the parking lot, which was adjacent, it was fine. 
So I, I'm assuming it's maybe the steel rebar and the structure. I don't know, but those are the experiences that I've had. You just kind of have to do the dance. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the next presentation will be, how do you get your part 107? Okay, so by the end of the next uh, presentation, you should be able to go past your 107. <laughs> yeah, not true. Um, so how many people here, I, I know Eric asked, how many people here are, are wanting to get their 107? Okay. How many of you would be interested in um, study group? Okay that met like at the 5.30 on a Wednesday for an hour or two for maybe three or four weeks. Okay. All right, so um, my email address is sswiu.edu, at iu.edu, and if you think you really want to do that, I'll put one together for you. Okay, so this is going to be <clears throat> technically what you have to do to get your 107, um, and one of the coolest things about the 107 is you, you actually get, you know, a license from the FAA. And if you, if you board a commercial jet and you go up and ask the pilot to see their license, it looks substantially like your license. <laughs> it doesn't say UAS on the side, but it pretty much looks the same, just from some different certificates. So it uh, really makes you feel like you're a pilot. Um, okay. If you're already a Part 61 certificate holder, and Eric, you were Part 61 certificate holder, I believe, regular pilot. I am, but I was not current, so I did not get grandfathered in. Gotcha. Okay, so if you're, if you're current, um, it's a completely different process. Um, and it is quicker and easier. Uh, so essentially, you, need, you take some online web training from the FAA. You take a form that says you did that and completed that. You meet with an FAA person in person. I hear what I read on the forums, I didn't go through this process because I wasn't a pilot, is the common mistake is before they meet with someone, they sign the paperwork. You're not supposed to do that. Do not sign the paperwork if you're going this route. You show up and you meet in person with an FAA person, and uh, they check your ID. You need to sign the paperwork, make sure you're current, uh, and then they can assign you uh, a temporary airman certificate uh, for remote pilot and command um, for small uh, drones. So if you're already a pilot, it's a lot simpler. First time pilots, basic requirements are going to be 16 years old, read, speak, write, understand English, be in physical and mental condition to safely operate, a drone. Uh, unmanned aerial system is the, is the word the FAA uses for drone, and small unmanned aerial system is actually what we're talking about under 55 pounds. Um, so you got to be, you know, those things. And then you got to pass an initial uh, aeronautical knowledge exam at an FAA-approved knowledge testing center. I took mine at Indiana State University in Terre Haute. If you go there on a motorcycle, there's nowhere to park. Um, it, um, these testing centers are uh, all over the country. Uh, you can look them up online. It's a, it's a proctored exam, uh, which means that uh, you show up to take, you know, you book the exam, you show up to take the exam, they, they check your ID, they take, you take everything out of your pockets, they put it in a locker, they put you in a room, and either a person or a camera's watching you take the test. 60 questions, test costs $150, 60 questions in two hours. You know if you pass as soon as you're done. Uh, if you fail, you gotta wait, wait for 14 days, the test isn't easy. So um, I think I'm a pretty good test taker, but I had to study for this test, uh, and I'm glad I did. Um, uh, you have to know some things that would seem to be pretty esoteric. Uh, basically, the, the aeronautical knowledge test contains information that the FAA requires regular pilots to know. So, for example, you have to know how to read the placards on a runway. You know, kind of obscure. You've got to understand in some detail uh, the concept of density altitude. As you get higher and the weather's hotter, 
aircraft performance is less. You know what? I flew my drone at 10,000 feet last month. Doesn't, doesn't happen that way to drones. Um, so, the, so, so the aeronautical knowledge test is, is if you, you need to invest some time, uh, to, at least I did, and I think most people do, to pass it. So would, would the, the Part 107 pilots agree that, yeah, it was kind of a hard test? Some would say not a hard test. OK. Yeah, so we got people nodding. It's a hard test. Um, how did I prepare for the test? So I wrote, enrolled in an online course. It was $299. From my perspective, it was worth it. This happens to be the one I enrolled in. Is it the best one? I have no idea. It might be the worst one. But it, it was good for me, and, and it helped. Uh, lots of YouTube videos, lots of really good YouTube videos on how to become a uh, Part 107 pilot. This particular one, and these slides will be available, I thought it's about an hour and a half, and I thought uh, was, was the best. It gave a pretty good overview of every, nearly every aspect of the knowledge test, some advice on taking the test, uh, just really excellent. Uh, airspace took me a while to kind of figure out because um, not only do you need to know it to pass the test and, and just give you a sense of what the test is like, um, for part of the test, they hand you a book or a brochure, well, kind of book thing, workbook. And that workbook has um, not, uh, charts in it, <laughs> uh, you know, aeronautical charts in it. And they say, okay, your mission is to do, do blah, 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 flight. How high can you go? Or something like that. And you've got to get the, get the chart out and figure out where they're talking about. You know, where, you know, because that's not always straightforward. Exactly where on the chart are they referring to? And you need to learn to read the aeronautical chart. And that includes interpreting the airspace uh, depiction on that chart. That's something that's useful to know. So the placards on the runway, I don't think I'm ever going to use that as a drone pilot. If I'm looking at placards on the runway, I should not be flying the drone there. Um, the, knowing the airspace is, is actually pretty important. Um, and to know it well, I think, takes some, you know, it takes some investment in time. I've got a, a real good friend of mine who's, who's been a pilot for a long time. And uh, I ended up, him, you know, I'd ask him questions. That's part of how I did it. I read this book, um, it's a, you can get it on Amazon, uh, and this was a, an interesting, it was a good resource. It was written by a pilot whose, whose career has been flying helicopters to capture images. So he flies cameras and helicopters, and, and the drone people get in his way. And he decided to get into it, and, and now he's to totally, he's like, uh, anything I can do with a helicopter, you can do with a Phantom Pro, you know, better. Uh, but it's a really good book that goes through the actual Part 107 language. So you have a section of the, the, the language from the, you know, federal code, and then an explanation, what does this mean in English? So I did all this. It worked for me. Um, it, it, you know, it, it is pretty substantial investment and learning. I didn't get a perfect score on the test. I got a good score. Um, and I think at the time, I figured I put in maybe 30 hours, to be honest, with a uh, combination of watching videos, take, doing the, the, uh, the school and whatever, um, before I went and took the test. And I scored pretty well on the test. Um, and so that was, that was good. Uh, was the 299 worth it? Yes, it was worth it. Uh, one of the things you got from this was um, the instructors are really good and they're pilots. In fact, they're pilot instructors. Uh, and it, it accelerated my ability to understand um, what it's like to operate a drone, if that makes sense, because these people did this for a living. Um, and so for me, it was worth it. Um, I could have passed it without it. Would have needed to study quite a bit longer. This is the best school, as I said. I have no idea, but it was, you know, I looked for some reviews online, and this one seemed to be stand out. A lot of people liked it. Okay, after you pass the test, 
Uh, there's an online system uh, the FAA has that you have to register. You can get a username and password. Um, you, these instructions are right off the FAA pages. Uh, but essentially, um, you pass the test. They give you a paper, piece of paper that says you pass the test. And then they register in some FAA system this ID that says this is a, you know, this represents a, uh, someone who's passed the test. Um, it takes about 48 hours for that test ID to be in the FAA system. So you get on the FAA system, you say, this is who I am, I passed the test, here's the ID of the test. Um, you fill out the rest of it, and you sign the application electronically, you, you know, the form, and you send it in for processing. Then you wait. Um, after you submit your exam, uh, they do a background check. So I had I have other background checks. For example, uh, I'm part of the, the TSA uh, pre-flyer program. I forget what it, you know, that where I get in the shorter line at the airport. Um, but it doesn't matter what, what background check you've, check you've already had. <laughs> it takes the same amount of time. It doesn't seem to expedite this. They do a, a background check on you before they issue you a uh, a license and what they initially do is you'll get after that happens to me everything's cool then you get a temporary certificate that you can just print out and then uh, months later they'll send you the actual card um, so I got this I, I stole this from a website borrowed this from a website uh, uh, 3d insider and and these are uh, just sort of uh, how much time you can expect uh, you know Sending an appointment for the knowledge test of the day, studying for a test one to two weeks. I said I probably had 30 hours in it. Taking the test, it's going to take a day because you got to, you know, it's not in Bloomington. You got to get there at the appointed time. Waiting for the results, two to three days, applying for the license, blah, blah, blah. Background check, they say two to four weeks. Once you are, once this happens um, and you're approved, you get a temporary certificate. And then one to two months later, you get the, plastic certificate. So that's it. That's all you have to do to get a Part 107 license. So um, I was serious. If, if you guys will send me an email, and if more than three people send me an email, and my email address is just ssw at IU, I will set up, uh, we can use space here, I'll set up a study group. Um, probably need to meet maybe three, three times, I'm guessing. Uh, and, and we can, you know, do some collaborative study uh, to get people closer to the point where uh, they can pass their Part 107. And any, if, if any other Part 107 holders want to participate and help, that would be great as well. Please send me an email. So questions about getting your Part 107? What kind of info they ask you? Background check. So I think, I, I think they want to... I, you know, um, normally a background check at that level, I think they're looking at things, you know, you're, you're, are you on parole, are you here legally, are you, you know, are you a U.S. person, you know, do you owe somebody money, I'm guessing those kinds of things. You know, does, does the, are you current on your taxes, I don't, I'm not sure, but, they, but the DHS does do a, a background check before they issue. Other questions about the... It's not too complicated, but you have to study for the test. Um, and and the, the study, especially if you weren't a pilot before, uh, or if you're, that's not a subject you've been interested in, you know, and, and are into it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's real work to get the license. Then, every two years, you have to renew it. Although, it's not clear to me what renew means. In fact, uh, I was under the impression that no one knew what Renew meant yet. So I was really curious when, Eric, you were saying... So, so the, FAA is in, the FAA is in my family. My father was an air traffic controller for 40 years, so I kind of know where the government is coming from on this. They, the... The small drone thing caught them completely off guard, so they're trying to model this system after becoming a regular pilot. So 
as a private pilot, I have to do what's called a biannual flight review, which is I have to go with a government. Uh, when you took your driver's exam, they had you went and got an ex you know you had to go ride around and parallel park with the person when you got your driver's license, and that's it. When you're a pilot, you have to do that every two years, and you go with a federal inspector who basically makes sure that you don't you can stall and you know all the navigations and stuff. So they're modeling this after that program. So what's happening is you have to basically know that let them know that your proficiency is up to date, and then. Because the misconception is once I get a private, uh, pilot's license of any sort, it's good for life. But you have to continue to show proficiency and skill in what you're doing and, and get reevaluated periodically. So that's why they're doing it every two years. And right now, they're only making you take the written test, which I think is sufficient and fair, because the regulations certainly now are changing so often. Which means I'll need to take one of those study groups <laughs> if it's the same written test, because <laughs> I will have forgotten enough. One other thing I wanted to cover, um, uh, we're running a little ahead, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about how you get approval to fly different places. Um, so uh, Eric talked about in, in good detail, um, you know, in Bloomington on the IU campus, you're in pretty good shape because uh, the uh, controlled airspace around the airport just gets to the edge of the campus. So, you know, five miles from the airport, there's this area of airspace called Class D or Delta airspace, and you have to get approval to fly in that airspace. Now, so let's say you, you want to fly in that airspace. IU probably has things on that side of town, no doubt. Um, the way you do it today is, gonna, is not going to be the way you do it uh, in probably October or November. But let me tell you how you do it today. So, Today, if you want to fly closer to the airport than five miles, and you're a Part 107 pilot, now, I'm a Part 107 pilot. I can fly my drone as a Part 107 pilot, and I can fly my flown drone as a recreational pilot. And the rules are different, and it's actually easier to fly close to the airport not flying Part 107. But if you're a Part 107 pilot, you want to fly close to the airport, you need to submit uh, a request for authorization to the FAA. And there's an online form, and it, takes, it can take 90 days to do it. Um, what you do is you say, I want to fly in this big area. You don't say, well, you know, three months and two days from now, there's this wedding I'm going to film or this IU construction site. I just want approval there. That's not what you do. You basically say, I want approval to fly in the Class D airspace around the Bloomington Airport. You go online, you describe you know, what you're going to do, what the safety features you have on your plane, how you're going to operate your craft, all that stuff. Um, typically, if your request is reasonable, it will get approved within 90 days. And they'll send you back a map that where they've taken the circle around the IU Airport, the five-mile circle, and they've carved it up into squares. And each square, there is a maximum altitude uh, which you have to fly under. Okay? And so just to give you a sense, at the very edges of this space, it's 400 feet. But near the hospital, it's zero feet. So there are a couple big blocks around the hospital where you can't fly. Uh, as you get real close to the airport, it's zero feet. You get a little ways from the airport, it's 50 feet. So essentially, they give you a grid that shows you what altitude you're approved at when they send you that authorization. It doesn't mean you, there are ways to say, I actually want to fly you know, higher than that. You can ask for specific approval, and you may or may not get turned down. But when you ask for the whole block of the D space, they send you this standard map out. You can get that same information on a bunch of different um, apps on your phone. AirMap is one of them, so you can look and go, okay, well, how, you know, I got approval, but I can't figure, remember how high it is right here at this intersection. You can look on the phone and, and get that. So that, that's how you get approval today for flying under Part 107. Um, in October, Bloomington should have, and I've actually flown in other places around the country that are already doing this, an online system. So you can take an app on your phone, and you can basically say, I want to fly right now, right here. And it will 
give you an instant authorization or not. So you basically, I've, I've used this at Lincoln, in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was flying there, and they were one of the beta testers for this. And you go into the, the phone app and say, I want to fly here right now. Here's some stuff you need information about me. And within five seconds, you get a text notification back saying you're approved to fly this, you know, below this altitude. So that instant system is being rolled out across the country, and I think we're the last place to get it. And it's supposed to be in October, last time I looked. I don't know if that's changed. So anyway, so that, that's going to change for how you do that. The other thing about airspace is there are things that happen in Bloomington on a regular basis that change where you can fly. So when there's a large sporting event, like there's a football game, there's a temporary flight restriction that restricts flights three mile radius from the IU Stadium. That includes my house. So when there's a game on for most of that day, I can't take the drone out in the backyard. Even though I'm not in any class D airspace, you can't fly it. And so, you know, one of the things you do, and, and Eric talked about it, is figuring out what, what, the, um, what the airspace rules are, but they change. And, and different apps will say, you know, there's a temporary flight restriction here, you can't do that, whatever. Um, the hardest thing I've had to deal with is traveling somewhere else where, where you're in controlled airspace and trying to figure out how to get permission because I didn't have 90 days to ask for it. But now that this automated, this instant uh, system is, is going to be available across the U.S., you know, that, that will be history. Any questions about airspace? Yeah. Um, so the question is, is that through the FAA Drone Zone app? So there's a Drone Zone app for the f iPhone and for Android, and it will tell you um, what, what rules you're operating within. So for example, if I'm within, if I start the app and I'm within five miles of the Bloomington Airport, it says, you know, if you're a recreational flyer, you've got to phone the airport tower and tell them what you're doing. Or if you have a, a, a authorization to fly, by the way, when I, I have authorization to fly in that airspace, still, I still have to call the tower and tell them. That, that app, I don't believe, it's not the app I used, and I don't believe it supports the instant, uh, the, the instant authorization. I don't think it's in that app. So the app I used is AirMap, which is a free app, and, and the FAA has a set of partners, uh, and AirMap is one of them, that uh, are allowed to use their API, essentially, to communicate with their authorization system. So if you have AirMap on your phone, and AirMap's actually a pretty nice application, and it's free for its basic functions, it'll tell you right where you, you can say, I'm flying recreationally, or I'm flying part 107, whatever, and it'll say, here are the rules for where you are, or you can say, I want to fly, I'm going to fly over here tomorrow, where are the rules there? And it's really good with the airspace stuff. It's not good for the TFRs, and in fact, the only thing I found reliable for the TFRs is the ForeFlight app. That includes the FAA web pages. So, um, and I, I don't understand why this is. Uh, the other thing is if you look on a big map and you look at the TFRs, you can always see where the president is. So if the president's somewhere, 30 miles. President goes to Indianapolis, you can't fly 30 mile radius from where his plane is parked. When Pence comes, and like goes to the park, I think he goes to Brown County State Park some of the time, visits there or something. Uh, it's not 30 miles, maybe it's 15 miles. It's big. So when those two VIPs move, there's a big uh, section of airspace that is restricted. And drones don't seem to have an easy way around that. If you're flying an aircraft, there are procedures to get in and out of airports that with, are within that. It doesn't seem to work that way for drones. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking about the airspace, that was D airspace down to the ground. There is a number of E airspace that starts at 700 feet above the surface, and I have an operation for which I'm running at, and I've got general aviation planes flying over our drone. Um, in that airspace, what I do is I file a notice to airmen, uh, 
usually 24 hours ahead of time before I go to fly. And that lets any GA or commercial pilot know, you know, I'm operating within the radius, like um, Stephen said you define, at a certain altitude and at a certain time. And it's just a little peace of mind because the airplanes, um, when they're on their downwind and they're final for landing, their pattern altitude is supposed to be 1,000 feet AGL. And it just makes me feel a little better knowing that they know I'm below them. And uh, there's just, it just in increases that situational awareness. And that E airspace is widely across the, um, the states. Oh, it's, I file it with flight services on the FAA. So, so I started to do that, and, and, and I'm trying to remember, somebody discouraged me from doing, there are two things, the FAA has a, oh, you have a regular pilot's license, too. Don't you don't? Okay. I, I want to talk to you. Interesting. I, um, the, the other thing is the, app, the air map application will actually let you say I'm flying and make that information available. And I believe that's part of the, the larger system the FAA is doing. So the partners that do the instant authorization are also going to feed the FAA with your, your flight plans. So any other airspace comments or? Cool. One other, one other tidbit about airspace, and then I'll get, off, I'll get out of here. Um, the, you're not permitted to fly a drone over people. And well, what does that mean? So the, in the Federal Register, there are about 200 pages of back and forth um, when the no, this was in response to the, the notice for rulemaking, I think, uh, when the FAA first established the Part 107 program. And they actually say what they mean. They fly over people means flying over, directly over someone. So if, if and, and everybody's going to jump up and scream, wait till I finish. <laughs> so if I'm flying a drone here, that's not flying over me. But if I'm flying a drone, you know, here over my shoulder, that's flying over me over my fingers, right? So flying over someone means technically flying directly over them. But in addition to that, you have to fly it in a safe manner. So, you know, you can't predict how your drone's going to fall. You can't predict, you know, if it takes off in some wild way, how it's going to go. So you have, to, you have to take all those things into account. But flying over people has a very specific meaning from the FAA. And that is, if you're looking NADAR straight down, is the footprint of your drone covering a body part of someone? If the answer is yes, you're flying over people. And the answer is no, you're not. So, uh, and that took a while. Those, it's like 200 pages. It's actually pretty interesting reading. The FAA talks about the, uh, they respond to comments about the regulations, and you end up seeing a lot of what their intent was. Okay, so who's up next? I forgot my, yeah, Tassie. Good. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. So let me get your. Hi. How many of you know what photogrammetry is? Oh, nice. Okay, good. It was a word when I like, um, so my PhD is in English literature and obviously I love grammar and then I was like photogrammetry, but it's not quite the same as grammar. So, um, so this is something I learned about actually only when I came here and I did a master's in information science because I'm trying to accumulate all of the letters after my name. Um, so this is a modified version of a talk that was given at PERC last week, which is a high performance computing um, conference, and we won most innovative paper, um, so yay us. Um, so one of the things that we've done here is we have access through Research Desktop, um, which currently it was implemented initially as Karst Desktop. How many of you have used Karst Desktop? Oh, significantly fewer. So the great thing about Karst Desktop is it gives you a GUI interface to our high-performance computing systems. So if you are new to high-performance computing, um, which I hadn't done since I was an undergrad and didn't remember how to submit batch scripts or any of that kind of stuff, you can now go to Research Desktop and you can get access to significant computing power. And the reason that Research Desktop is so great is it's on Carbonate, and I just found out today because of someone's set of photos that he gave me, that when I log on, I get 75 gigs of memory on my little allocation. So I can do a lot of stuff in the GUI without even like sending it out to process elsewhere, which is pretty cool, because 
this was a very high poly count model. So um, talk to you a little bit about sort of done some of the introduction. But so photogrammetry, in case you didn't know, it's a method for extracting three-dimensional models or measurements of objects, environments, or terrain from a set of two-dimensional photographs. It's actually as old as photography itself. Um, it was used extensively during World War II uh, to determine where tanks were when they were covered by those big nets, right? They could see the difference in the terrain by comparing these orthophotos. Um, it's applicable to a broad range of academic disciplines ranging from cultural heritage, which is a lot of what I do, to architecture, to paleontology, who we've worked with Gary Motes, who's in the back, um, to medical sciences. Um, and obviously there's GIS stuff too. So um, it was high computational complexity and large data sizes, which is what makes it a great sort of um, HPC use case. Um, many of you will recognize this statue. How many of you know why it's applicable today? And listen to me. It's Ernie Pyle Day. It's the very first Ernie Pyle, National Ernie Pyle Day. Um, this is what our legislatures have been doing in Washington. Um, <laughs> and um, there's a bunch of stuff going on actually on the other side of campus. Um, so Ernie Pyle obviously is sitting out in the corner of the new media school. We've taken a bunch of pictures and um, stitched them together. It takes about 300 photographs um, to capture a life-size statue. So again, this is not using a drone yet. We'll get there. Um, stitch them together, and then we put them up on Sketchfab for now. That's actually a, a sort of another thing that lots of people are addressing. Um, you know, it's the same way that YouTube is a great place to share your content, but what happens if, like, Google decides to censor it tomorrow, right? It's not an institutional repository. So, um, so that being said, here's the task um, flow. We align photos and generate a point cloud, um, then we build a dense point cloud, then we build the mesh, and then we build the texture. So here, this is where we've done sort of the initial aligned photos, and every blue square right here is the position of a camera. And so you can tell we tried to be really regular. Um, we were using a tripod. Um, and you can see how we went all the way around the statue and took these regular photos that overlap by about 60%. Each photo overlaps with the other by 60% so that it can find matching points. So here you can see this is the dense point cloud. And this gives you a really quick idea. This is actually pretty quick to process. So I did this for the first time on the fly. I went with Steve Vinson, who's an Egyptologist, to the Brooklyn Museum of Art with some of his students over spring break. And they were taking photos. And then I pushed them through the HPC system really quickly so we could see if we had captured everything. And it turned out, because some of these were on plinths that were sort of this high, and then the top of the statue was up there, and they were sort of using this, like, boom, but it was like jury rigged, that we had missed some parts of those statues that we knew right away. So we were still in the museum. We obviously didn't have access to these statues all the time. They could go back and take those pictures. Um, this is what the mesh looks like. So again, you can look for errors here. This takes a little bit longer to build. And then finally, for most of us, this is what makes it look like actual Ernie Pyle, right? Here's the texture. Um, and it's a JPEG that's wrapped onto the mesh. So this is why it is computationally complex. Because it is doing this every time it's trying to match up all of these kinds of points. And if you want to go read the Wikipedia entry, it's actually really well done. Um, but that being said, my kids, when I, I just call them that at this point. So when I teach my students, um, and they're like, why does it take me so long to get a result? Because <laughs> on, the, on the computer, we can process Ernie Pyle. I'll show you sometimes, but probably about an hour, hour and a half. And they think it should happen in like five minutes. And I'm like, no, no, no. On a typical beefy desktop, before you parallelize this work, processing Ernie Pyle would take eight hours. And I'm now saying you can have the full model in an hour and a half. You can have that sparse point cloud in about seven minutes. So that's actually a huge difference in how these workflows have been handled in the past. Um, so again, this is where now we're able to do things like this. Um, and I think someone mentioned drone flights in Mexico. Um, this is Monte Alban. Um, it is a pre-Columbian city in Mexico. This was done by um, 
graduate student Alex Badillo, and he was working with this GL. Um, it's, a, it's a project run out of another university, but they contracted with him um, to go down and do these drone flights. And so he is actually our, our extreme use case. So he had over 14,000 photos um, that probably on a regular computer would have taken weeks to process. He used 30 nodes, and it took about 30 hours. So now you're looking at even maybe a week on lots on like a dedicated sort of LAN network is down to a day. You just go to, go to bed, get up the next day, do some work, and by the time you're ready to have dinner, it's done. You can see the Rose Chapel here, um, which was done by Matt Brennan, who works with Bernie Frischer's group, um, which is, um, they've also been contracted to do all the statues in the Uffizi. You may have read some of the press about that. Um, and then this is the inside of Saint-Chapelle in Paris, France that he did as well. Um, so you can see there are large collections. There are also many data sets that have different needs. So this is something that Gary in the back did, where you can, um, you're comparing a whole bunch of ephemera which he taught me the plural for femur. Um, and, and if you're a good student, you should be able to tell what these all came from. Um, we have here, um, this is actually, he's called the boxer. You can see he's got the wraps on his hands, um, which is again in Italy. And then this is actually the Cosa archeological site. And this is another um, project that Matt was working on where as you excavate, you destroy, right? You're never gonna get that first layer back. And so what he did is he did flyovers sort of every day to preserve those levels of excavation. And now you can go in and sort of see how it evolves. So I think that's a really cool use case. So there are a lot of software tools out there. Um, we are looking at open source workflows, um, but you can see how I've noticed like Photoscan is a solution. Reality Capture is a solution. Come back to them in a second. Open source literally actually requires like call map, open MVG, open MVS, visual SFM, like all scripted together. And it's not trivial. So we're working on making it more trivial for you. Um, that's one of the projects that um, Research Data Services is, is investigating and actually throwing it onto one of the like Exceed systems. So putting it on Jetstream, um, leveraging the use um, of big, making use of Stampede, and then actually making this available to anyone who wants to sort of use what would be a photogrammetry gateway. And for me personally, I'm from New Mexico. Um, I really believe in tribal colleges and places that don't have lots of money having access to do their own digitization um, and not having to come to outsiders to show them things that are often sensitive. Um, so the reason that they aren't doing that right now is floating um, licenses that can be checked out to any node are, I think the educational price is about 500 bucks. We buy per license. Um, we bundled them and we've got, gotten the price down a little bit there and then managed to put all of them sort of on a licensed server, which again takes someone with the know-how to do that. Um, we, did, we went with Photoscan because once you've bought that license, it's sort of good until they hit version 2.0, which they have no plans to do. And, the, and they've been around for a while and they're sort of the standard. Reality Capture actually has a faster algorithm, and I'm not going to deny that. It's also really high quality. Um, why are we not using it? It's 7,500 euros a year plus a maintenance fee or 15,000 euros for a lifetime seat, that's one seat, um, plus a maintenance fee. And this, comp this, comp the, the, this company has only been around for three years. So what happens if I sink all my money into the reality capture game and they go, don't go, doesn't work out right? They're also Windows only. So we'd have to set up a container, right, and run it in that to, to take advantage of some of the HPC or the GPU options. Um, Photoscan has a Linux distribution. So implementation. Um, Grunch and Ron, who works again with RDS, has, um, along with Bill Sherman, has helped us to do sort of some logging. So when we're all in a photogrammetry project folder, if something doesn't work, I can go check the logs and I can see what happened. Um, we also have this job agent. I mean, this is all sort of, you want to know like the, the guts, the sort of um, nuts and bolts of something. I can actually give you more specs. I'm not going to go into this one as much today. 
Um, but the check punch pointing is really great. Um, so we like it also because it means that if something sort of fails at a certain point, then we can sort of restart it. Um, so we've done some performance evaluation. So here you can see my corn maiden who has traveled all over the world from me, starting in, with me, I'm starting in New Mexico, um, now finally landing in Indiana, where I bet you she didn't think she would ever live. Um, we have Ernie Pyle again, and then we have a, a subset of the Monte Albon pictures. So here you can see the total size of the images. She's only 63 images, because she's this big. Um, again, Ernie Pyle, so he's 389. You can see sort of the density of the megabytes. This is also, she's, these were shot with my personal DSLR camera, which is $500. This is with our $3,000 photogrammetry kit, which you can check out from us. And then this is with the drone. Um, these are the specs of our HPC systems. And you can see where we set the quality settings and the runtime with varying nodes here. And so you can see Monte Alban, which is probably what you're interested in. Um, so here it took four nodes before it was ever even able to complete on Medium. So that's something good to know. And again, we could go over this if you want to do this workflow and sort of give you the nexus of options that you have. Because if you know anything about HPC job scheduling, if you ask for 30 nodes, it's going to take a while for your job to get scheduled because there are only a certain number of nodes, right? It's like you're trying to pull into traffic, but you've got like 30 tractor trailers hooked up to the back of your car. And so that should be a big space before you can get in there. Um, but then you can see that the run times, we also looked at, so is there a plateau, right? At what point do you have a diminishing return? Um, and these were still sort of coming down, so we're probably gonna extend it out further. We only recently went up to 100 licenses. I think we had 60 licenses right up until May. Um, and so you can see the speed up here, and again, um, so we are really looking at sort of, like Corn Maiden meeting, she really, after eight nodes, and I expect that because that's not very big. Same thing though happens. So big red is actually not a great option, just FYI. Um, and then here on carbonate, again, it's speeding up a little bit. We're sort of getting diminishing returns. Um, and then especially on high, like it's actually not helping us at all, but we're still seeing like Ernie Pyle um, really speeding up here. And if you want to look at it differently, it's like, where is it spending all this time? Um, one of the things you should know, so no matter how many nodes you ask for, and this is the other reason Carbonate's great um, over Karst, is that at the point where it has to build the OBJ and the texture, it does all of that on one node. So it doesn't matter if you request a thousand, that part is not paralyzable. And so that's why you'll see, especially in multi on high, when it gets to that point where it's finally building the OBJ and the texture, like, yeah, the build model is actually dominating the processing time. And we're hoping that that's something that Photoscan might get better at. Um, so in conclusion, um, who is using this? How's it going? Um, we've run 919 jobs in the year and a half that we've sort of been rolling this out. The first like six months were a soft rollout. Um, most of them were run by, or many of them were run by students, which was great. We were really happy to see them use it. Um, we've got our sort of average run times, our average requested nodes, um, and then with the photos, there's that 14,000 and then my tiny little corn maiden here. Um, so we're going to offer alternative photogrammetry tools. Um, we are also thinking about, right now, you can run on Jetstream if you want to, which is not applicable, I mean, really to anyone here at IU, but if you bring your own PhotoScan license. So we have this bring your license to the party. Um, we're going to do this complete pipeline support um, where we do have photography best practices. We talk about photogrammetry choices, cleanup, data and metadata. So it's also a wild west when it comes to metadata right now. Um, Gary and I were both at a meeting in February and like the presentations of like what you should like preserve, like should you preserve like the camera settings and where does that all of that data go? Um, should you talk about the environmental conditions when you're outside shooting? What kind of language, you know, is there like controlled vocabulary? This is probably all stuff if you're not a librarian you don't care about. But for some of us to look back on it as a recreatable scientific workflow, it's actually really important. Um, and finally, this public dissemination piece where again, Sketchfab is fine for now but I would never say, oh, this is like a permanent solution. 
Um, we are looking for new users. Um, so if you want to build, if you want to do it here, or if you want to use it on Jetstream, contact us. Um, and like I said, we're looking to build this user-friendly interface or science gateway um, by fall of 2019. So, oh, the last part is that I might actually show you some models. Not at all. Oh, resolution, maybe a uh, pixel ah. per centimeter or something. If you want to produce like a Google-like picture and also have elevation data, so you can have contour lines or whatever, um, this is how you do it. So, for example, uh, I, I've taken you know, 500 pictures of a 12-acre space, use photogrammetry to produce um, a giant JPEG or tile JPEGs that, that are just like Google Earth, and then I have a super high-resolution uh, height model for this. So if, if that's one of the things you're thinking about doing, and in fact, it's, it's and, and you know, this is what she's going to show you, it's, um, in some cases, uh, it, it does a height model that's, that's approximately what you get from LiDAR. So you can see here, I mean, MeshLab does have the ability to annotate, which is really great. Um, again, it provides you sort of, if this is not, either you could do like a pre-trip or it's somewhere you're never going to go, you can see sort of, also um, Alex has put up, like if you wanted to look at some of these individually. So here's building J. Um, and I know that uh, National Geographic was going to do a special at some point when that happens. It'd be really cool to sort of see our um, high performance computers and workflows sort of shown there. So, but you can see like this has more detail, right? So there are, that's the other thing is if you use Sketchfab right now, of course you're going to have to decimate to put it online. Otherwise it'll take forever to load. But that being said, right now files um, have to be for educational licenses that are free, they have to be less than 200 megabytes. And I'm about to show you what I did to um, Steve's really awesome flyover. <clears throat> of um, those are the Adam and Eve that are in the, <laughs> uh, that are in, if you've been over to, I don't even know what to call that building anymore that they're redoing, but they're in the courtyard over there. Really? That's not what I said to do. I didn't, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean pro. Yeah, I, I guess. Um, oh, Katie, I'm not logged in. Oh, you did, is it, it's not private? Oh. You just one pilot. Oh, we did. Yeah, right. Oh, right yeah. There. Okay. There's two of them. Yep, we did one million and five million because we didn't know if we were going to get them condensed enough. Okay, great. Sorry, we have some private models too right now. I'm working with the Lily on some stuff. So, um, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about this while I just sort of? Yeah. So, so this was uh, about a, I think an eight minute flight uh, over the data center. Uh, if you if you actually just looked at the uh, the JPEG picture, not this model, the resolution is, um, it's a pixel per half an inch, maybe, pretty high resolution. Um, and so I basically had the drone, you know, I told the drone, fly over this area, and the software automatically flies over the area, takes all these overlapping pictures. I manually flew it along the sides to get some side images okay. so you could make a 3D model. And lo and behold, um, there is an overturned uh, wheelbarrow. <gasps> By that blue patch on the roof. Really? <laughs> um, but from the, it's a 3D model, so I have a rendering of this that shows the exact slope of the roof within an inch or less. So I've got a, you know, to where the topo lines are every inch, and you can see exactly how the roof slopes. Uh, so probably an eight minute flight, but a lot of computer time. Yeah, so when I um, stitched this, it came out with. Um, 20 million vertices and 45 million faces, <laughs> which I can open on Research Desktop. I can barely open them on my computer, but I can't run the decimation algorithm on it. Um, and just so, you know, like most of the time you're going to want to clean up your models. They're not going to come out perfectly great the first time. Um, things like ZBrush, which is also a paid for thing, or we use MeshLab, don't really, I mean, you're going to run out of memory. Um, if you have something that's over 5 million, 
polygons. It's just going to run out of stuff. And so that's when, or, which is why you would chunk it maybe at this point, right? Like you would say, oh, I really want to preserve that detail of the, of the wheelbarrow. Maybe it's an ancient wheelbarrow. I don't know. And so then you're going to probably chunk this and then put it back together later. So a couple other comments. The, the actual photos, the, the, the uh, JPEG I created using photogrammetry uh, to stitch them together, you can see the pebbles on the roof. That's how detailed it is. And I used some, I created some uh, ground control points using the GPS in the back room. And so there's a geotiff of this, which is accurate within an inch. So I've got both the elevation accuracy and see where the roof slopes, kind of slopes where it leaks. Oh, I'm not supposed to say it leaks. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but so again, eight minute drone flight, uh, but, and then a whole bunch of time in the computer. Do you remember how long this took to stitch, Katie? Pre-stage about half an hour, which is like the first to generate the sparse point cloud. And the post took 45, oh, four to five hours to get me something that I can literally, like I said, not open because it's so dense. Because, it, it, you know, so um, obviously I could have processed it at lower quality. Yeah. It, it took oh, me days to do it at home. Okay, so yeah, exactly, which is like I said, that's been the model that people have used in the past. When I first um, met Bernie, um, when I was taking his class, I was really, I was studying this person-sized statue um, that he had collected, and it took him, yeah, eight to ten hours to stitch things, so, yeah. yeah I think uh, more comment, but I think it's important to mention that Magisoft is, uh, have, we have a 30-day free trial mm -hmm. with a new email address, um, and so, you're definitely capable of creating more than one email address. Many of you probably have more than one. Um, so you can definitely string together some free trials for a while. And I think that's full functionality. Um, it does. So, and, it's, and it's very, very easy to make a model. It's maybe not easy to make a really high quality model that is perfectly located. Um, but really, you can do things with just one click. You can batch process. So Yeah, and we have um, a DM script now yeah, so if that we could even give you. If anyone's so. interested, it's free to play around with. The only other thing I would suggest is if you want to be able to place it in real life, um, you need a GPS tag on the photos. And so most drones, DJI drones, will automatically geotag the photos. Mm -hmm. But if you're taking a video, for example, and you're taking frames out of the video, they will not have GPS tags on them. And then you can't make your model fit into like a real life coordinate. So those are a couple practical aspects. And, and like I said, it's, it's free. So if you, if you have a drone and you have photos, it's kind of fun um, and a good learning experience to play with it for 30 days. So. Yeah, 100%. Um, when we were first even playing with it on our, our, our kit here, we realized that if we just, um, we let the license expire and then we reinstalled it, it would just start over again. And we were like, so um, I have this picture. So they're based in Russia. And I think there's these two guys. They now have four employees, but they used to have two employees. And I picture them sitting in this office and like chain smoking and like drinking the vodka. And like, because you get these answers that were like, mostly understood your English, but like not all the way. Um, but they've been amazing in terms of support. Again, if you go back to Reality Capture, there is a trial version. Everything is watermarked. You can't export any of your models. And it's 99 euros for three months. It's not even free. So. <laughs> Stuff, you can, it's full functionality. So you can export anything. It is. You can do anything yep. you want for yep. 30 days. It is. It's, yep, it's full functionality. Mm-hmm. Um, the li they have an educational license, which is uh, between five and six hundred dollars, I think, as opposed to the normal commercial license, like three thousand. Yeah. So we have Pro, we have PhotoScan Pro. Like I said, we now have a hundred licenses. Chain those together. Um, we're really hoping to have people use them. We're happy to sit down with you and go through this not at breakneck speed um, and sort of show you how to how to build models um, and also troubleshoot with you as you go. So, any other questions or comments? Is it time to fly drones? No. Okay. Thank you, Cassie. Yeah. Okay, Quinn. You got your show and tell stuff. Yes, yeah, so I, I got stuff to show. Do you want people we'll to, to? I wonder if people want to want to come up. Certainly. Um, Just uh, it is expensive, so uh, we have kind of top of the line equipment. So just uh, yeah. Don't touch it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't explicitly ask for permission either, so, but so, I'm pretty sure I'm good. Too bad Larry's gone. Cause, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, if this is in the way, I apologize. So. Right. You want to? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, so hopefully this should be a little entertaining. We're kind of transitioning from kind of the basics of how to you know, get licensed now to more like applications. Um, and so I'll get to it in more detail, but I'm a, a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. It used to be geology. I think it's been EAS since I've been here. I joined in uh, February, uh, yeah, late February, so I haven't been here too long. Um, thanks. Uh, so, so this is this is funded by uh, the Grand Challenges Initiative, prepared for environmental change. So there are a couple of the, couple of these Grand Challenge initiatives, um, kind of created by by the university to really focus a lot of research effort on these particular problems that are really impactful in the state of Indiana. So I think one of them has is focused on opioid abuse. This one's focused uh, focused on environmental change, um, and I think there's a third one that maybe hasn't started yet or is in the midst of starting. Um, so the outline today is going to be LIDAR, right? What is LIDAR? Why do we use LIDAR? Right? Um, the next is going to be the motivation for LIDAR plus UAV integration. Um, you can hear UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, drone. I actually prefer UAS, which is unmanned aerial system. As you'll see, there's quite a bit more than just the vehicle. Um, so I like to call them a system because they really integrate a lot of components. Um, I'll talk about the Earth and Environmental, or Earth and Atmospheric Sciences unit. We have the LIDAR and the UAV capabilities. I'll get into data collection and processing, and then I'll give you some examples of what we do with it, which is landscape change detection. Right? And at the end, I'll summarize, uh, give a conclusion, and hopefully we have time for quite a few questions. All right, so LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. So it is exactly the same concept as radar, but with light. All right, so the unit emits pulsed laser light and measures time and wavelength of the reflected light. All right, so the speed of light is known, it's constant. We can measure that, the amount of time it takes to get from the emission source reflected back. We can get very, very, very accurately the location of things that reflect the light. Right, so again, it's really the same concept as radar, which I think most people are familiar with, but it's with light. And so these are examples of this kind of point cloud. So we talked about point clouds, uh, the previous presenter, in terms of photogrammetry. Um, essentially, these points are discrete individual returns of that pulsed light. Um, so again, anything that would reflect light, or like this table, should be able to be seen in that point cloud. So this is an example of a bridge. Um, this is an example of trees and tree canopies. Um, and really what LIDAR does, right, is it allows researchers, anybody, um, to obtain very high resolution topography and landscape characteristics, right? So kind of on, in the perspective of earth and atmospheric sciences, um, you know, it's really crucial for a lot of disciplines within earth sciences, right? Geology, geography, archaeology, forestry, ecology, many, many more, right? And, and so again, LIDAR is a kind of another tool in the tool belt um, of, of people who work in these, these disciplines, right? You can do things like photogrammetry, which again, which we talked about. Um, we can have things like LIDAR. They're separate, they're complementary, right? So this is another tool that we can use to assess things like landscape change. And so this is a good example, right, with LIDAR. Um, so I just actually went to Google Scholar, and I think I took the first result. Sorry for not citing it. Um, uh, but this shows what, what, how the, why this would be important, right? So this is an active area of landsliding. You can see where there's been additional sliding, new deposition. You can get really, really highly accurate data to actually do things like measure the amount of change that there's been. All right, so again, this is, this is for kind of uh, earth science, right? This is a, more of a geology application, where there are many, many applications where you might want to know where things are. You might want to be able to map things and see how things are changing. So the motivation for LIDAR and UAV integration is that really until recently, LIDAR has typically de been deployed from an airplane, um, and even more recently, terrestrial, which is mounted on a tripod. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys, right, what are some potential downsides to a setup like this? Can anyone just yell it out? Right? Why would we maybe not want to have to hire an airplane to get LIDAR? Yeah, it's expensive, right? It's something we can't really control. We have to put it in the hands of other people. Um, it's not something we can do quickly. It's not something we can mobilize in an afternoon. It's not something we can really mobilize in a week, right? Um, beyond that, there's issues with having access to the data. Um, it's just more challenging, right? But what about some potential benefits of being able to do that? 
right? Think about today, what we talked about. Yeah, range, right? You can be higher in the air. You don't have to buy equipment. You don't have to be licensed, right? If you're not a Part 1A or 107 drone license, if you don't have that license and you want to get LIDAR, well, then, you know, you can't fly this drone, so you might want to do this. Um, so, again, just, just, just kind of giving you the background that, that LIDAR has been around for a while, right? It's typically de deployed. Just have a typically deployed, oh, it doesn't show, um, from airplanes, right? And so really the motivation behind integrating this technology, right, is to give the power to the people. So in other words, remove some of the typical barriers that you had when you had to kind of outsource your LIDAR. And so again, some of the benefits is that smaller scales, right? If we wanted to fly and get a model of just this building, right, it would not be very pra practical to hire an airplane or a helicopter to fly just to get this building, right? Um, we really get temporal resolution, right, repeatability. Um, so again, if you're really looking at something like an active landslide that might be changing every day for 30 days, there is no way you're going to be able to contract out uh, an airplane and LIDAR and measure that every single day for 30 days, right? That would probably be millions of dollars, right? Um, and so can you think of any potential complicating factors, though, right, when you remove these barriers that are typical? So a lot of what we've been talking about today, right, if you yourself is, are, you know, are flying a drone that costs money and have equipment on it that costs a lot of money, if you are not very good at flying, if you don't pay attention to the rules, you could risk your equipment, you could risk other people's equipment, you could risk damage to, to infrastructure, you could risk a lot of things, right? And so again, it's kind of a double-edged sword, is that you get more ability to choose how you use this, but at the same time, you're on the hook for doing it, right? You have to have the skills and ability and knowledge um, to actually use it correctly. And so again, along with this is, you have to be licensed, right? This is my license, I don't have all the information. All right, so I'm gonna kind of shift now and kind of show you what we have here. I have a picture here, I'll, I'll kind of go over. Um, what we have on this drone. So this drone is, is very expensive, very top of the line. Because we were part of this, this grand challenge initiative, there's money available and there's money available to get something that can really, really give us high accuracy and in quite a bit of, of, of unique pieces of, of, of data, right? And so um, this is our drone, this is a DJI drone. And if you want anything about like prices or anything, you can ask me, I'm totally okay. It's not. It's not my, I actually didn't buy it, right? So I don't care. Um, it has a, a Sony A600 DSLR on it, which is in the, uh, at the red arrow. Uh, it has a LiDAR unit, which I'll show you. Um, and it has hyperspectral imagery, right? And so this RGB camera can be used to do things like create orthophotos, can be used, and we do use it for things like photog photogrammetry, structure promotion photogrammetry. Um, the LiDAR gives us millions of these discrete points where the light reflects. Um, and the hyperspectral imagery, um, can be used to get uh, imagery that's beyond the, cap uh, the uh, red, blue, green wavelengths, right? So you can look into near infrared. And that's very important for agriculture, geology, biology, again, many different uh, disciplines. And so if you're not familiar with what hyperspectral um, imagery gives us, is that essentially on our unit we have from, this is 400 nanometers up to 1,000 nanometers. nanometers. Um, and again, that can give us information like if vegetation is healthy, you can see vegetation that maybe is, is water stressed. Um, you can differentiate really well between wet soil, dry soil, different rock types. Um, so really hyperspectral gives us kind of a, a more information than just what our, what our eyes can see. Right. And so i kind of show you here, right? this is our drone. Yeah, so the drone itself is like something like $10,000, right? And we got a, uh, an upgraded IMU, um, or sorry, we have an up upgraded uh, GPS unit on it, and that thing costs like another $5,000. And this is by far the cheapest thing that we have in this entire setup. And so I'll just kind of show one. Um, this is a really kind of serious piece of equipment. So if you're familiar with the, with the DJI Phantoms, you know, I, I actually often just take the box it's with and fly it off the box, and I land it usually into my hand because I just like doing that, especially if it's windy or if there's something you want to avoid, power lines. This is a totally, completely, uh, completely different beast. We actually have a big landing pad for it, too, um, because we don't want dust to be kicked up when these rotors go, which really will kick up dust. And so this is the LiDAR unit itself, right? So this is in six figures amount of money. Um, when I mentioned that it, it has, uses laser, the laser is emitted from here. 
and then it reflects back up and measures the length of time, the flight time of that light. And here is the uh, DSLR camera. So again, this camera we can then use just to get an orthophoto or photogrammetry. And then finally, that hyperspectral camera is very, very, very small. It weighs maybe about a pound, and it actually goes on the bottom of this. All right, so you can see my motivation for kind of calling it a UAS, unmanned aerial system. It really is a system. It's more than just a vehicle. It's carrying quite a bit of equipment. It's all sharing the same power. Um, it's, it's a relatively complicated thing to do. And you guys are... If you want, you can come up and kind of touch the stuff, pick it up, just be careful, uh, just to get a sense of the weight, right? So this weighs probably about 10 pounds. This weighs about one pound. This probably weighs about like 15 pounds or something. And so we really need to have a very powerful drone to carry this. But what it does is it, it really limits things like battery life when we're carrying everything. All right, so this is just the, the general idea of the setup that we have. And so like I said, it's, it's, it is really top of the line. It's probably nothing anyone here is ever going to have to worry about and ever use. Um, but it really can give us the ability to do quite a, do, quite a bit of interesting things in terms of, of the research side of it, which I'll get into. All right, so the steps to collect data, right, pre-planning, which is days or weeks ahead, First of all, we want to know what the science question is, right? Just because we have this doesn't mean we just want to go flying it and say, ooh, what are we going to get? Or we want to make sure we're really answering a question that requires something like this, right? Do we want to risk putting all this into the air and putting all the effort if it's something we can get from photogrammetry from a DJI Phantom, right? Um, so we really want to identify the science question. And so in a case like this, we're looking at erosion of this river. The river is going from left to right. This bend is eroding into a farmer field, uh, and we wanted to be able to characterize that topography in high resolution and be able to go back to that same site and characterize it, for example, after a flood. Right? And so the things we, we kind of think about are crew availability. Right? Um, it takes a decent amount of expertise to be able to operate this. We, need to, we actually have a, a pilot, uh, luckily enough, who kind of like works for us, which is awesome, so I don't have to fly this. I actually, when I first came here, I crashed a Phantom. I'd been flying drones for like three years in my PhD, and I assured everyone, oh, I would never crash anything. And a couple, like a month after I got here, I crashed their DJI. Um, we already had the pilot. That's not the reason we got the pilot, but uh, yeah. Uh, we, we create flight plans, which is an iterative, iter, iterative process, right? We work with the pilot. We work with us who are actually doing the research, and we decide what do we need to do, what are we capable of doing. If the pilot says something like, well, if we're taking off up here by that first waypoint and we have to fly all the way here, that's going to be a really tricky line of sight. Um, I don't feel comfortable flying that, right? So we really kind of go back and forth to make sure we're able to answer the question we want to answer, but also are able to, to practically use this safely and legally. And then we have to ready all the equipment. And it's, there's an embarrassingly large number of batteries to be charged um, to do one of these. So this is another example. This flight planning software, I can answer questions if you're curious what we use. Um, but it can give us, kind of, this is kind of where we edit the flight plan. We can view the flight plan in, in Google Earth um, and do some other things to kind of make sure the flight plan, plan looks like what we want it. On the day of collection, we do a site check. We actually have a phantom that we fly first. We fly the phantom along this flight path because if something's wrong with the flight path, if we said to be 60 meters above the ground, but for some reason someone typed in 30, right, and we would hit a tree, we really, really want to find that out before that's in the air, right? We'd much rather crash a $1,000 drone than a system that has six figures of money into it. Um, we do an equipment check and setup. We fly the drone without any equipment on. Um, and then we're ready to actually acquire data. Um, and we figured out that we can do about one 15-minute flight per hour. And so the, the, it's about 15 minutes, maybe a little less, of, of calculating, of actually getting the data. Before we take off, we have to sit still for five minutes to calibrate the IMU and some other things. And when we land, we have to also have to sit still. Um, so we bring a generator out in the field, and we can do numerous flights in a day. Six is kind of the most we've done in a half day, so we could probably do easily 10 to 12 in a day. And this is an example of, of, of actually the data that I would get in real time. So this is that uh, inner bar right there, the kind of that sandbar with the trees growing on it. This is a, an oblique view of that. And so you can see we really get this data coming out in real time. It's very impressive, very dense. Right. Well, one comment I want to yep. make is, is with photogrammetry, you can get the topography data later after a lot of computer time. Yeah. With the LIDAR, 
that is its data. Yeah, well, so this is a, it's a very, very subsampled version because after, after, for about a 10 minute flight, we get about 20 million points of data from the LiDAR. And so this shows something like 5% of that or something. So it doesn't show all the data, but yes, we can see it in real time. So we have a, a, uh, an omnidirectional antenna that we use to actually communicate while this is in the air. So we can see the data coming in in real time. If it doesn't look right, right, that might indicate to us something's wrong, right? So we really need that uh, real time data. And I can talk about you know the, the pros and, and cons about this com lidar compared to photogrammetry if anyone wants to ask questions um, after. So when we're done, right, the first thing we always do is transfer data as quickly as possible. Like somebody else I forget, mentioned, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you have all the data on one, you know, hard drive or one flash drive or one SD card, right? Um, we is immediately we we put it on at least three different sources, right, or three different uh, kind of levels of of having the data saved. Data processing steps then, I kind of go through this because this is, cause is actually a very kind of complicated uh, long process. Do just downloading the data takes a while. We sometimes get up to two, three hundred uh, um, images from the DSLR. Just downloading that takes some time. Um, we just downloaded today actually some data from that hyperspectral camera and it was like 30 gigabytes. Right? So it, it takes quite a while to actually get all the data downloaded even. Um, we correct for navigation, right? We have a really, really high quality uh, GPS base station that I didn't bring along that we set up. Um, we submit our GPS to Opus, which is online positional user service. Um, we use data from the inertial measurement unit. We essentially get the data as high quality as we can because it doesn't matter if we can get all these cool points if we can't place them in, in real life very accurately. So it's a kind of a bear just to get an idea of, of just to make sure everything is corrected in terms of navigation. Low data and really, really basic processing takes about half an hour. Um, and editing and cleaning the data takes about an hour. And this is in situations where we can remove, or we can improve accuracy, remove vegetation. So this is an example of, of removing vegetation. All right, so the suite, of, the suite of processing software we use has automatic algorithms to remove vegetation. Um, in this case, the orange dots are ground and the white are vegetation. So this is the exact same view, one with vegetation, one without. Right. And so again, it's pretty impressive, kind of these, these default algorithms. And you can tweak them. Let's say it didn't do that good of a job removing these trees. Or let's say there's something like shrubs or bushes, a lot more challenging to remove. Um, so you can kind of make your own version of cleaning, right? You can also manually edit this. So if, it, if the algorithm misses a tree, for example, you can just go in there and say, tree, get out of here, right? So this is a, it's Terra Solid Suite. It's a, I think it's Swiss or it's Finnish or something. It's a Finnish uh, company. Um, it's re, there's a quite a steep learning curve for a lot of this software, right? And then we can export the data for use in, in GIS software, any other, you know, even, even MATLAB, right? We can export these in a lot of different uh, formats. So this is another example of removal of vegetation, right? So this is with the trees. This is a little slice cross section through the data, and that's without the trees, right? So it really does a, a really good job most of the time. All right, so to kind of shift away from this crash course of what it is, what it's capable of, I actually want to show you some examples of data that I've collected so far and, and actively ongoing research, right? So um, there's this little town along the East Fork of the White River it's named Sparksville. Um, if you zoom in, there are these two meander bends. So this is a river that's moving from right to left. And my background actually is, is, is river studies in earth science. Um, uh, Resolution is kind of poor on these. Um, but you can kind of see these erosional features that are kind of short-circuiting these bends. All right, so that's something called a, a river cutoff, right? And that's, as you would imagine, not really a good situation for people who own and farm that land, right? They really are not happy seeing their land being destroyed and seeing the river change course, right? And so we know cutoffs are natural. It's part of what a river does. But at the same time, we want to know more about it. And we want to be able to tell someone like a farmer you know, given changes in climate, given changes possibly in, in land use, human use, are we going to have more erosion, less erosion in the future, right? How are we going to be prepared for environmental change, right? And how can we maybe help farmers do things like protect their land? This is very, 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 very valuable land, right? And so this, we have this bend, Bedwell Bend and Martin Bend. I'll start on Bedwell Bend. Um, you can kind of see here, up on the right, um, there was a statewide LIDAR flown, which again, the state contracted out uh, LIDAR. 
Um, so it was actually flown on, a, on an airplane. Uh, it's really not that high resolution. It has like a, like a one meter resolution. You can see it looks a little fuzzy. We went to the same spot. This was a flight actually in June. We went to the same spot and we can see A, how it's changed since 2011. And we can see we have a lot more high resolution. And what's really interesting is you can kind of see that channel again on Bedwell that connects these two parts of the river and it looks interesting now. Um, compared to what it did before. The formation of these kind of big holes actually go into the field. I should have thrown a picture up. And it's actually just a massive hole in the field, right? So we want to know how do these form, um, what impact do these have on actually creating this new channel? Eventually there will be a new channel there. And we want to be able to tell the farmer maybe how long it would take. All right, and so again, this is in June 2018. This is kind of a, a zoomed in view on these holes. You have this really large hole, and you actually have no data in the hole there because there's actually water in the hole. And so uh, LIDAR does not reflect, the light does not reflect off the water. Water absorbs the light. Um, but you can see that really large hole, which is about 30 meters by about 20 meters. And you can see these really kind of small initial kind of pseudo holes that are forming upstream of that. And so again, what's really awesome about having this, this LIDAR is that we can scan this, which we did, and there happened to be a flood that activated this channel. We actually went out there and we measured. We measured some velocity. We got some, some data along that channel. The flood receded, and now we can go back, literally days later, right, and see what changed. And so we were actually, actually able to go back out in July once the water went down. And here, in this case, um, you can see the red colors are erosion and blue colors are deposition. So you can see that there has been some change to, these, to this large hole. Um, in particular, on the kind of upper part of that hole, there's been both erosion and deposition of up to about a meter. And you can see these small holes are actually growing, right? So there's erosion on kind of the, the edge of these holes. So this hole is that one. And so again, this is something that would be really, really challenging if we tried to actually hire someone. We would say, hey, let's fly the, you know, we could hire someone to fly it in June, but then while we watch the flood, we would have to say, oh man, okay, we're gonna have to go through the whole process again, hire them, are they available, can they do it? Whereas we can monitor the river, we can get out there, we can see, wow, it's really flooding, and then two days later, one day later, we can get out there and actually measure. Right? And so we've been back and we have more measurements. And one thing that's actually really interesting is we had a, a, a time when the river was really low, no flooding, nothing going on, but we had really heavy rain for a couple days. And actually you had kind of streams of water moving in from the surrounding field into that channel and was actually building it up. There's actually substantial deposition. So this is a really interesting science question to us. We can be able to say, you know, we can see the elongation kind of enlargement of these holes from floods, but then we can also see filling in possibly of the holes from actual just water moving in from the farm fields. All right. So again, that's, that's really kind of interesting for us to be able to describe how these processes work and how you eventually have a river cutoff. Right? These, are, these are processes that have not been described in the literature. Right? And again, we can only really get this because of the tool we have. And this one is maybe not as interesting to me. This is just an example of, of the next bend, or the bend upstream of it, Martin Bend. You can see the 2011 LIDAR. There was kind of one channel that's connecting the two rivers, flows from right to left. Um, and you can really see how that's extended. And you have really, really large amounts of erosion up here. So it's actually forming, or trying to form, a second channel. And what I think is interesting about this is this farmer was very, very proactive. He did not like having a channel there. so he planted trees, lined this all with large trees. And it might be a little bit hard to see here, but uh, this has actually gotten more narrow. So this initial channel has narrowed. There's been deposition in that initial channel, but it didn't solve the problem because the, the focus of erosion just moved, right? So again, to kind of summarize, right, this idea of what is LIDAR, why is it important, right, I hopefully made the case. Um, again, what's the motivation for integrating LIDAR and UAVs? Again, kind of the, the, biggest, the biggest advancement that this makes for us is we have both spatially high resolution data, which we've kind of had for a while, but now we have high temporal resolution. Like I said, we've been out now with this uh, 31 times. Well, we have 31 individual flights, so we've been out something like 10 times. Um, and again, that's something that Yes, it was a really, really large initial investment, but if we have 50 flights a year for the next five years or something, right, we can really get a lot of awesome data that just wouldn't be practical if we relied on you know, outsourcing this. 
again, what can we do, right? That's kind of the idea is now that we have this tool, right? What's the science we can do? What can it do that other tools can't? Um, and what are some important basic steps for collection processing I went over? Um, and again, can you get a, you know, if someone were to ask you after this presentation, can you give examples of science questions that the tool can help us answer? All right, so I think you can probably think of those on your own. And here's a, an example. It actually is landing back. Right, this day was actually windy. You can kind of see in the background. It had gusts up to about 15 uh, miles per hour. Um, and this has everything on it. So uh, our pilot does a really great job. He actually landed previously when I was taking a video off the pad. His first time ever landing off the pad in 31 flights um, because the pressure was on. So I, he redid it and landed perfectly. Right. All right, so any questions or comments, I'd be glad to answer anything. Um, and again, if you want, you can come up here. I think if you are going to come up and look at it, I'll just be there. Um, just like I said, it's quite a bit of money. Um, but please, any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Yep. Yeah, we discussed the relative merits of scanning LIDAR versus LIDAR. Can I discuss the relative differences of that? Yeah, so I don't really know that much about those different this is definitely a, a scanning lidar right so it, the the mirror in here like spins around so it kind of spits out points i think it operates at something like a thousand hertz or something like that so it it spits out points very very frequently and it does like you said it actually like puts a line you can actually see the line in the data right because so you can see a line and a line and a line and i'm not exactly sure what what flash lidar is um i know there's things like is that related to like photon individual photon counting lidar yeah right that's what that is Yeah, so again, I don't know much about that. I do know that they are not small enough to be able to be integrated into the UAS. So I know these, these single photon counting LIDARs and some of this other LIDAR technology, which maybe is, is higher guess, quality than this, a lot of those are, first of all, I think a lot of them are in their infancy in terms of the technology. And secondly, I think that's not to a stage where we can integrate that yet onto a small UAS. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's one thing that, again, I wasn't here. I wasn't even at Indiana when we made this purchase, when they made this purchase. That's something that everyone's kind of a little worried about, right, is since technology moves so fast, at what point will this be kind of obsolete and could we get something better, right? That's kind of a question we always have to, to ask ourselves. And so there are also some other things we can do with this. They, they sell a, a backpack mount so you can actually walk around and you don't have to. Right now we have to put it in the air to use it, which is kind of crazy, right? That's a six-figure piece of equipment that we have to put in the air. But again, you can buy things like, like different mounts to use it in different ways. So yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a big question is, is when you're dealing with technology on the cutting edge, right, is, is at what point do you decide to go all in, right? They kind of decided to go all in on this. But two years from now, there's probably going to be a better system, right? Five years from now, we might not even be using the same LiDAR technology. So, yeah. The other yeah, so it's RTK. So, so this actually, um, this actually comes off, right? This this set of antenna are actually what DJI says, DJI RTK, right? They call it their own version of RTK. This was like a five thousand dollar improvement. And this actually, although it is RTK, we set up a base station. It, it all it simply does is correct relative. Right, so it makes sure that that there is no really there's minimal variation relatively, and that's important for when we fly our flight line. We don't want to be kind of drifting off of our flight line, but it actually does not give you absolute position. So what we have is another GPS that we have to set up, another station, which then communicates to this, and that is that is real RTK. Yeah, yeah. So RTK is real-time kinematic, if you're not familiar. It's a way to kind of use a, a stable, use a, a point GPS that isn't moving to correct any, any kind of discrepancies, I guess, in your actual GPS. So it's a very commonly used technology. Yeah. And, and with RTK, you usually get accuracy within a couple centimeters, like real, like absolute accuracy. So. Oh, video's still playing. Sorry. It's... Launching from a parking garage and not being able to calibrate your compass, and and that's because of the steel in the in the yeah. parking garage, and that's and that's a common problem in industrial settings when you're inspecting things that have lots of steel in them, and one of the other uh, use cases for the DJI's RTK is the yaw can be slaved to the GPSs and not the compass. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and, and I will also say that this, 
so, so the company that does this, Phoenix LiDAR, they're an integration company, right? So, so the, the LiDAR is not made by Phoenix. This is not made by Phoenix. This is not made by Phoenix, right? They make this. They make the integration. But we have found it's even, even for them, it's, it's hard for them to keep up with some of the technology. And we have questions that they can't answer. They say, well, you know, we don't really know because we're not experts in this or not experts in that. Um, this was actually the first of its kind they ever built. We were the first people, I guess, who wanted to put a hyperspectral camera together with this. So they kind of built it all from the ground up. Um, and again, that's kind of another like, like warning about using these advanced technologies is sometimes the people building them can't answer questions. So then when we have issues, it can, can become very challenging. Um, we've actually recently randomly had an issue where um, the flight is just slightly offset of the flight line. So we actually fly this, you can see in real time, that is following the flight line, but it's just offset by something like three or four meters. And we told them, we said, well, this isn't good, right? <laughs> we want to make sure our drone is following our flight lines. And they said, well, we don't really know what's going on, so sorry. So we're trying to get this fixed. Yeah. And we did lose an engine, too. We actually, on one of our, our motor, on one of our, our flights, we got to the field, we got all set up. We flew this without the equipment on. As soon as it took off, one of the motors stopped. And luckily, our pilot was awesome and was able to kind of kind of wrestle it to the ground. So these things definitely aren't fail-safe. And when you have equipment <laughs> hanging under there that costs six figures, it can be, it can be scary. So, yeah. okay. Thanks. You could leave it here. Yeah, I think I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do is uh, probably take a 10-minute break, and then um, we're going to have uh, Eric. Can you guys fly? Great. Yep. And uh, you're going to be able to show your camera operator uh, on a big screen. So that big screen is probably next to that white CRV that's in the field. I assume that's where you're going to put it. And then Jeremy, Jeremy. He's setting up. Uh, I think Jeremy is going to do a uh, flight, sort of like the flight I did over the data center, and show how that's done. And so you guys want to kind of meet over there? You ready for us to take off? Yep. <laughs>